Got it. <laughs> That's the button. That's the button I'm after. Hello, everybody. You're all very welcome as you join us today on a Friday for Behavioural Science Club. Uh, I'm Louise Ward, as you all know, my co-host Prakash Sharma, and today we're very lucky to be joined by Matt Watkinson. Matt Watkinson is CEO of Methodical. He's also author of two books, The Grid and The Ten Principles Behind Great Customer Experience, and I think he's possibly in production for a third. He can tell us about that when we invite him in to join us. He calls himself an Englishman in LA, and we'll talk about that as well. <laughs> and also, Matt, I'm hoping to talk about a recent posts that I read uh, where you discussed the leaky bucket analogy. So I'd like to welcome Matt in to join me now. And hello. hello, Matt, you are very welcome. And um, is this correct that you are in production for a third book? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the third book is um, is written and is in is in editing at the moment, which is a interesting process. If by process you mean total bloodbath, but yeah, it's. Um, it's coming together uh, pretty well it's it's um, due out next year and for members joining us who don't already know matt maybe matt you would just generally how how do you introduce yourself uh it depends whether it's at a party in a social construct or whether it's professionally and i think in <laughs> fact that's a an area where a lot of us could improve because sometimes we mix those those scenarios up uh, uh well i mean what the short version is that i I began my career designing websites and software at a time where I was just in the right place at the right time. Everyone was talking about user experience and that being the kind of key to success online. And that just happened to be the thing that floated my boat and that I, I devoted my professional energies towards. So that's where I began. Then um, we had this proliferation of new devices and, and, and channels uh, that we've obviously experienced over the last 10 years, iPhone, iPad, we've got kiosks, everyone already had, well, not everybody, but companies already had kiosks, call centers, showrooms. So for the kind of brands that I was working for, which are typically kind of larger corporations, the challenge became about joining those things together rather than having um, like into a more cohesive overall customer experience. So that's how I ended up working in that field, basically just, just following my nose. So that's what led to the publication of the first book that you mentioned. Basically, my my realization was that, you know, in most disciplines, you have a, a, a reliable body of theoretical knowledge to guide your decision making. You know, if you are an engineer at Boeing, you probably know that F equals MA. You know, you don't just go into a wind tunnel with some plasticine and come out with an airplane like there's there's conscious thought behind it, as well as prototyping and iteration. But, you know, I felt like we were missing some of that. So I tried to identify these reliable principles that we could use to, to, to guide that process. And that, um, yeah, that book was rejected by everyone who thought it was a crap idea. And then it won business book of the year, which, you know, is kind of how publishing goes sometimes. Um, uh, and yeah, so the outcome of that, and, and particularly the success of that book, uh, which was championed really by Rory Sutherland, who I'm sure most of you know or have heard of, or are, is, is, you know, has influenced your own thinking as it has mine. Um, you know, be, be, because it kind of went, went whoosh like this, um, from that point on, I was kind of effectively promoted out of doing the job that I knew how to do. Nobody would actually pay me to design anything anymore from that point on. People just wanted me to drink coffee and talk about it and point at, keynote slides and um it kind of dragged me into this realm of strategy which i didn't really know much about but what i s soon discovered was that people made decisions without really kind of identifying what the root cause of their problems were or what their real growth opportunities were they're just like well we're doing this customer experience thing because everyone else is doing it 
without necessarily thinking about is this where we should be investing our, our, our time and money and 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 really the realization was that people needed to look at a business as a kind of interconnected whole where they were trying to optimize the overall performance rather than just optimizing one local area and hoping that if you did that everywhere it would result in um in um in in success so that's what led to the second book the the, the um the grid which was my uh uh the, that is really I, I gather the focus of what you want to talk, talk about today which was this way of looking at a business as a, as a system as a kind of interconnected whole it was actually inspired by the fact that i had um yeah, I had surgery on both my knees, which didn't work. Uh, it didn't actually solve the, the problem, like the, the pain that I'd endured for years. And then after trying every kind of specialist, even going under the knife, uh, I found this therapist who was looking at the business, not the business, the body as an interconnected system of kind of myofascial tissue and muscle and, and stuff. And she traced the problem actually back to these muscle imbalances in my hips and in my ass and gave me this kind of program of exercises to do, which basically fixed the whole thing in two months. And, and, and it triggered this idea of like, wow, that's how we should be thinking about, about our decision making in, in business, really. Like, well, if we spend the money here, how does it affect this over here? Or if we cut quality over here, how does it affect this over here? And there wasn't really a way of doing that in a kind of structured fashion. So that's what that that's what the, the, the second book and the model within it was all about. And of course, when you say that, Matt, it's one of these things that as somebody says it, it sounds so obvious to see a business holistically rather than in silos. But of course, it's not the way most people look at businesses. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly not. And, and, and there's a few reasons for that. I think one is um, we're all specialists, right? So our department almost kind of forms a horizon line that we can't see beyond, which is a, which is a problem. And, and we're structured divisionally, but these divisions now, all, all boundaries are for the sake of convention and convenience. They're not, they're not real. You, you know, the boundaries that we, that we draw on an, on, an, on an org chart or in, an org, or in a structure are, you know, are artificial. It's, it's always some kind of tangled web of informal stuff going on in the background as well, you know. So, yeah, I mean, uh, and, and also, you know, just a lack of general, a lack of general under, understanding of, of the fundamentals of how these things actually work and consideration for second order effects. And this is why we have, you know, these, when you look at these utterly breathtakingly idiotic scandals that happen, it's almost always been caused by somebody looking at a complex problem in a reductionist manner. So Wells Fargo in America, the CEO was like, well, I want every one of our customers to have eight products. Eight is great, was his mantra. You know, but if people didn't want eight products, what do you do? Well, it turns out what you do is you give them those products anyway and charge them for it and kind of commit fraud on an, on an epic scale. Well, that's great because that grows your business until people find out. And then suddenly it turns out that that was a bad idea. You know, Hoover, I mean, Hoover to really take the cake of this. Hoover in the UK did a promotion once where they offered... Um, return flights to New York from the UK with any purchase of over a hundred pounds. So, you know, what happens when you do that? Well, you get a stampede of sales. Great, we achieved our goal. We sold a lot of toasters. We've sold so many toasters, we can't possibly fucking make the number of toasters that we've now sold. But now we've actually totally destroyed our company and we're filing for bankruptcy and everyone's been sacked. You know, so it's basically exactly this thing of what are the second order effects but when you talk about something like behavioral science or the things that i'm interested in uh, uh, as well I'm, I'm interested in that but you know design or customer experience or those kinds of things these disciplines traditionally do not sell themselves very well and and the reason is because they're not capable necessarily of articulating or pinpointing 
how their intervention maps back to, oh, sorry, just not my table, maps back to these kind of elements, if you like, on the grid where we say, well, if we intervene here, or if we spend our money here, how is this going to um, affect the, the organization as, 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 as a whole, you know? And so I'm, I'm assuming that that's why uh, <laughs> that's why uh, you're 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 interested in it, but that that could be just my own idle speculation. Well, yes, I think you've pinpointed um, something uh, early on, which is that uh, certainly in the discipline of behavioral science, there's a lot of literature out there, but it's very theory based. And so there's a great demand for people trying to, as you say, pinpoint how can behavioral science exactly help my business? How can I specifically use it? And is this, do you think one of the reasons why your first book was so successful in that it was, it's eminently a, a practical book as opposed to sort of the theory and concept behind user experience? Well, look, there's two, um, there's kind of two monkeys fighting over one banana in my, in my mind with, with this kind of thing. So on the one hand, I want to write the most reader focused book that I can, that creates the most value possible for the, for the reader, right? So for me, that means clear and concise prose. It means a, a crystalline structure and it means actionable stuff and it means good examples that help people get it and that ultimately you get to the end of the book and you can do something differently tomorrow than what you were doing today that hopefully will be will be better right so that's side one the other monkey that's pulling the banana this way is that i kind of only am interested in writing books that i am excited by and want to read right so you know because it's hard and it, and the something that you're really pumped up and, 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 and enthusiastic about. And I just think that it happened that at that time, when I wrote that book, that thing that I was really excited about, or that thing that, you know, as a practitioner myself, I thought this is a problem we need to solve. People got it, you, you know, people really did get it. And, um, and because it was packaged in that kind of written for the reader way, which a lot of business books aren't. I'm sure you, you, you know, you've experienced that where it's all about the author and his ego and he's just prattling on or, you know, it should have been a blog post and it's just been padded out by 70,000 words. We've all read books like that that are terrible. <clears throat> but I think it just happened to be in the right place at the right time and, and yeah, was had that, that pragmatism to it. Now with The Grid, it's been a little bit different. It hasn't landed quite as well because I think that the idea... The execution of it is better than the first book, like five years more experience as a professional writer, it shows in the writing. It's, it's a better written book, it's a better edited book, and it's a better produced book. Timing wise, conceptually, I think, and, and marketing wise, maybe didn't quite get it right. And um, yeah, so that's been a little bit, a little bit different. But yeah, I think you're right about the first book. And often it's interesting to hear you tell us the background to you writing the first book because often that enthusiasm comes through very much to the reader when someone is passionate about a subject and it delivers it delivers the message in a very different way because that enthusiasm is conveyed so maybe you know that that contributed to the readability of uh, of your first book but i'd just like to more specifically talk about user experience. Now I'm in yeah, sure. no means uh, that knowledgeable about user experience, but uh -huh. I, as I said, I read on a recent post of yours where you were talking about this leaky bucket analogy. Right. Yeah. And something that really resonated me was, you said something like um, brands grow through acquiring new customers and not, improving the loyalty of the existing customers and you said some people find this hard to accept would you like to maybe uh tell 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 the people who are listening 
you know, the full story to the concept of the leaky bucket and then put forward your, your view on it. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's pretty simple. When people talk about growing their business, one of the popular analogies that people like to use is, is like a leaky bucket where you're putting water in and some of it's leaking out and that water being customers. And um, yeah, and the argument being, well, it doesn't make sense to pour water into a leaky bucket because it leaks out of the bottom. Therefore, we should plug the leaks in the bucket and then we don't need to put as much water in, right? So that's the, the, the essence of the leaky, leaky bucket analogy where the water going in is acquiring new customers and plugging the holes is, um, is retaining them. Now, it, it sounds like it makes perfect sense. And, and in a way, you know, it, at a certain level of ab abstraction, it does make sense, but it relies on some assumptions that aren't necessarily true right so it relies on assumption number one being that you can plug those holes and there are some things that you can do and it depends yeah i mean if you're totally crap yeah there's there's a lot of things that you can do to to, to plug those holes but if you look at the data the vast majority of defections for most businesses are caused by things that are totally beyond our control so we can't actually plug those holes like if a customer dies there's no plugging that hole Right? If a customer emigrates to the other side of the country and we're a coffee shop, there's no plugging that hole. You know, if, we're, if we sell booze and our customer takes dry January, we, we can't plug that hole and, and, and so on and so forth. Right. So a lot of the time, this assumption, well, we can just plug these holes. So that's what we should do. It doesn't, it doesn't really work like that, you know, and that's, that's a, 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 a major challenge to this analogy. Another thing is, which like offers the, the, the most kind of relative bang for your buck or which is the biggest opportunity. Typically, there are many, many more people who are not our customers than are who are in the market or who are switching. So focusing on acquiring those can be a much better, better strategy. The other thing is that and this is getting a little bit into the weeds of, uh, of this. I'm not sure how technical you want me to, to go with it, but there, there are a law-like patterns like double jeopardy, for example, that says the more customers you acquire, the more loyal they become as well. So actually, if you want to have a, a more loyal customer base, it, you tend to get that through acquiring more customers. And that actually, the experience that people have during their first purchase is a large determinant of their subsequent purchasing, which again should suggest that you might want to get that past a purchase first time. Great. We also tend to observe from the data that it is new customers who drive positive word of mouth, not happy, loyal, existing customers for obvious reasons. We share the news, not the olds. So we talk about stuff we've done today, you know, or something we bought today. Oh, I just bought this, blah, 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 blah. You don't arbitrarily start bringing up random crap that you bought 10 years ago to, to people. They think you kind of lost your mind. It doesn't really work like that. So when you actually look at the, at the data and the patterns of people's behavior and you look at what we can control and what we can't, then the evidence actually skews towards more of a focus on acquiring new customers if you want to grow your, your business. Now, that's not to say that loyalty and satisfaction don't matter. We're talking about relative relativity here. And back to the idea of the grid, you can only spend the money once. So what are we going to prioritize? Is it going to be A or is it going to be B? If you're prioritizing loyalty based on a set of assumptions that you can meaningfully reduce customer defections, and some people even claim you can reduce it to zero, which is like bananas stuff, doesn't make any, any sense, no evidence to support that. It really depends what your interpretation of the data is and what your uh, assumptions or hypotheses are that you're working from. Now, and of course, on satisfaction, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah, if you have like a string of one star reviews on your Yelp page or Google or whatever, yeah, that's gonna affect your ability to uh, 
acquire new customers because people are going to see that, right? So I'm not, what I'm not saying is that efforts to retain customers don't make sense. Of course, we should try to retain our customers. Of course, we should. I'm not saying that satisfaction doesn't matter. Of course, it matters. It matters a great deal. What I'm saying is that from the perspective of trying to grow your business and from the perspective of trying to minimize risk, bear in mind there's safety in numbers, right? If we have one ultra loyal customer and they then disappear, our whole business goes down with them, right? Which you see in agencies all the time, incidentally. Acquiring more customers spreads the risk, safety in numbers as well. What we see from the perspective of like what makes sense to focus on as a growth strategy is actually more less of a focus on retention, which everybody is obsessed with, particularly in customer experience land. They're not even asking what the problem, they're just assuming loyalty is a solution and, and more of a skew towards acquisition. And this is all you know, evidenced by data from pretty much every geography and category on the, on the planet that that's what you've got to do. That's so interesting. And with so many members who are really interested in uh, branding, the concepts behind branding, and we've had other speakers remind us that, you know, people don't really care that much about your brand, so don't take it to heart. But do you find, Matt, that when you put this argument forward, um, being that, as you say, the weight is skewed in a different way, that it takes, it's either rejected or that it takes a while for people to accept it? What's what's the usual um, sort of response to this, this approach? Yeah, not good, I think, is, <laughs> is, is, the, is the answer to that. I mean, you've got to bear in mind, in, in the customer experience community, right, we have people who have written books that are called, like, I love you more than my dog, and that they think that that's what businesses should be trying to, trying to achieve, right, this, like, kind of canine level of, of, of loyalty and, yeah. and, 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 and faith and, and love and everything like, and we make fucking parking cones or conical flasks or, you know, safety jackets or industrial machinery for power stations or whatever. It's not really like love doesn't enter the picture, you know? So there's like this entrenched, deeply entrenched kind of, layer of kind of gurus and thought leaders in this field who have set out their stall based on this this concept of um a, a, a massive focus on loyalty and retention based on kind of faulty data or assumptions mm -hmm. or that kind of thing and you you know i i can't remember the exact quote but there's like and i don't remember who it's from but there is a famous quote from someone much smarter than me who said something like given the choice between changing our mind and like getting busy on proving why we don't need to change our mind, almost everyone goes for the latter, right? So, and I, I have to be, to be clear and candid with you, honestly, I've had to change my mind about just about everything over the last 17 years. You know, I, I started off with this set of assumptions and beliefs because that's what, you know, when I was learning from people, that's what I was taught. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like almost everything that I've, I've learned uh, has been shown to have been kind of wrong or mm, it's not quite like that or maybe there's some nuance here or there's something missing you know and I've you know I, I mean I've, I've read 500 books on my field and what it's really taught me is that I don't really know a lot you know I mean there are some and and and, and that there's a lot of nuance and complexity and subtlety and context involved in any of these fields that comes from a combination of practical experience, that comes from a combination of, of, of study, and it comes from a combination of having dialogues like this where you learn and you share. But yeah, I just, the, the, the frustration I have is this kind of closed mindedness. You, you know, or we've sold, we've sold, hang on, we just spent five years convincing our leaders that NPS is the best thing in the, on planet earth and now it turns out that that's a load of nonsense what am i going to do it makes me look silly but it doesn't matter like you have to engage with reality you know you, you have to be willing to change your mind and update your beliefs and adapt them if you're going to grow and if you're going to succeed in a, in a dynamic world and and it and it and some people are doing that a lot of people are 
you know, but some people very entrenched don't want to do that. I think it's generally accepted that when we get to the stage where we realise we know very little, <laughs> it's sort of like the, the ultimate nirvana in our subject, however, however much we have actually read in it. Um, and I mean, we've had other guests with us who very much advocate uh, your argument. I'm thinking now of Adam Ferrier. His book is called uh, "Don't Listen to the Cu Don't Listen to the Customer," yeah. and I think his theory is Wonderful that it book. by yeah by listening to the customer, it just le leads to many very generic brands and products because you're trying to please so many people as opposed to a niche possibly a niche minority yeah absolutely i mean uh, i i really loved adam ferrier's book and, and i love his 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 point about you know i think my interpretation about of, of adam's work and I, I had a little kind of dialogue with him about it yeah, I mean, you've got to be focused on your on your customers' needs, but that execution has to be distinctive. Yeah, you know, or you have to be willing to innovate on behalf of your customer, not just in response to them. If you want big gains, I mean, that's that's my internalization or reflection on the hypothesis. Like, if you look at what all the people who are like absolutely demolishing industries do. They're willing to innovate on behalf of the customer. And if they don't like it, they go, well, okay, we, we learned something there. What they're not trying to do is like follow them around and just do exactly what they want because you're always a step behind. There's a, there's a relationship between risk and reward. And if you want a big rewards, you've got to take some risks. You know, you've got to be willing to try things and experiment. And, and you know, failure is unfortunately a part of that. You've got to be willing to try things and experiment and see what works and um, yeah, innovate on behalf of the customer. And I really like Adam in injecting that because when I read his book, I, um, I was already of that mind. I'd already like had my clock cleaned by Byron Sharp and everybody else. I saw that kind of coming up here. You know, I'd already like swallowed those pretty bitter pills coming from a d design customer experience background. So I was like, oh, fine, let it wash over me. I love it. Yeah, who cares about the customer kind of thing? It was, it, it was fantastic. But I think a lot of people are going to look at that idea and they're like, well, you're kind of questioning my religion here. I'm like, well, that's the thing about customer experience in business is that it's not a religion. So you can just change your mind. <laughs> You know, like we talk about dogma all the time and how bad that is. And we just need to accept that we're all learning. We're all growing. Nobody knows everything. And there's nothing wrong with saying, you know what? I learned something new and it's a little bit scary, but it looks like it's solid. So I'm going to dig into that a bit more, change my mind. And, um, you know, that's a, a kind of superpower in this day and age, if you can do that. Yes, sure. So now, members, I will say to you, if you have any questions for Matt, make sure you put a comment in the chat box. Um, yes, thinking back to Adam, Adam's conversation with us, there were certainly members at that event who found a lot of what he said hard to swallow. And I think, as you say, Matt, a lot of that was because of what they had been taught. But I think if I understand rightly at this stage, there is a lot that's taught in marketing that really hasn't ever been properly tested and has just gone down the lines of time and become sort of the concrete mantra without anyone really ever questioning it. Do you think that's somewhat the case, Matt? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, well, I, okay, so to, to be clear, I mean, I have spheres of competence. In, in, my, in my sphere of competence, which it was, I mean, I'm probably unconsciously incompetent, now I have to say, which was like designing websites and software and that kind of thing. It was pretty easy. And, and I can tell you why it was easy. We designed something, we prototype it, and they put it in a room with the target customer and there'd be like a two-way mirror or be looking at them on a screen or something. And they'd, and if they didn't press the button, we'd be screaming at the grass, press the button, it's huge, it's green. Why can't you see it? Just press the button. 
And we realized like through that period of testing that our design worked or it didn't work. And then we would change it and we would fix it and it would be fine. Like design or, or UX design was inherently driven by, by testing and, and research and seeing what worked. And if it didn't work, you couldn't argue with it. Like if 100%, if, if 100 people missed a button that you've designed and you want them to press it, well, unfortunately your design sucks and you have to change it, right? So that was, that was easy. Like humility is built into the process of, of being a good designer. You know, confident, yes, but receptive to feedback and, and, and humble. I'm not so sure it's built into other disciplines in the same way. You know, I mean, I mean in customer experience, for example, like the, the area where I'm kind of talking about now all, all, all the time, I'm not sure it's really built into that, that, that discipline in the same way because it has religious overtones to it. And, and, and I think it's because to an extent, it's a feel good job with a moral component. It feels right to take care of your customers, right? Doesn't it? It's great. I believe in the mission. I do believe that. I believe that we can affect people's quality of life in a, um, not necessarily in a, in a huge way, but we can affect people's quality of life. So it's a little bit easier to pay your gas bill. If applying for a mortgage is like 10 times less stressful, these are great things. It all adds up. You know, we interact with, I think Kareem Rashid did some research on this. I think it's like 600 products a day. You know, if all of those were a little better, life would be a little better, maybe a lot better, um, you know, d depending on the circumstances. So there is like a moral feel good component about it. And I totally get that. But there's also got to be a commercial component to it because we're spending a non-renewable resource. We're spending our, our businesses cash, time, people's lives, people's energy on doing this stuff. And if there's not going to be any kind of payoff for it, you know, then should we be doing that? You know, and so I think it's trying to get to this, this win, win, win of customer value, better business success, more distinctive brand is where I'm trying to get people to our clients, the people that I'm kind of trying to teach or coach on this. And a lot of people are just like customer loyalty, don't care about the other two or assuming that if we do this, then we get the others automatically, which just isn't true, you know. And um, hearing, yeah, <laughs> hearing, hearing you say the word customer, customer over and over, you know, we're all very familiar with the concept that in behavioural science, we believe the customer doesn't know what they want. And you mentioned behavioural science earlier on. Uh, in your conversation, you mentioned Rory's name. So um, yeah. who, who or what do you think has been sort of most instrumental in your uh, behavioral science, in the behavioral science aspect that you, you bring to your business? Yeah. Before I go, 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 go into that though, Louise, I think it'd be helpful because we're on Zoom, we've got video here. If I actually just show people what I'm talking about here. That would be great. Thank you. So, this is this is the grid and it's and it's extremely simple. Okay. We've got three goals that we're trying to achieve up here and keep in balance. Desirability, if people don't want what we're selling, we've got a problem. Profitability, if it costs us more to make than we can sell it for, we've got a problem. And longevity, the longer we're profitable for, the better, right? Because often we have to make big long-term investments that need payoffs, uh, as 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 much as anything else, right? What makes achieving those three things difficult in practice is, is, is change and balancing other people's needs. And that's where these axes come in. We've got the customer, who they are and what they want. We've got the market we're in and those forces and how we need to uh, tackle that. And then we've got our own organization, which has its own strengths, weaknesses, constraints, and, and limitations and everything. Now, because a business is an interconnected whole, any one of these three things that we're talking about here can affect any one of these three things that we're talking about here, right? So what you end up with is this uh, grid of nine factors that together are gonna determine the success of, of, of every business. So if you look at column one, desirability, if our customers wants and needs change and these stay the same, you know, we're, we're likely to see a decrease in desirability. 
if our wants and needs stay the same and our product stays the same, but our rivals do something stupid and get caught up in a scandal, we probably become more desirable. If we can satisfy this need better than these people with this, we get more desirability. So it's emergent, you, you, you see that there. Profitability, well, customers give us revenues, organization incurs costs, and in the dynamics of our market, we have bargaining power with our suppliers, regulators, all that kind of stuff, which can also uh, affect our success. And then from the customer point of view, the bigger our customer base and the more committed it is, the more sustainable our business is going to be. From a market point of view, the harder we are to imitate, assuming these other things, the more longevity we, we, we have, which is why people invest so much in patents and IP and trade secrets and that kind of stuff. And our own organization's ability to adapt is massively influential. If all of these things going around here are changing and we're stuck, you know, we're, we're, we're going to suffer, right? So these are the, this is like the simple version of the grid. So what we're talking about here is if I spend my money here, let me give you a simpler example. If I cut costs here in a way that compromises the quality of my offering, my customer base is going to be unhappy my revenues are gonna go down and I'm right back where we started kind of thing. You see what I mean? Everything's interconnected. So if we now expand that a little bit to um, include more factors. So, I mean, and these are all very simple, by the way, I know it's a bit overwhelming at first sight, but when you look at revenues, you've got price and volume. Price times volume is revenue and you've got your revenue model. Is it like one side, is it like, all you can eat, is it power by the hour? Is it time and materials, you know, whatever it might be. Growing your customer base, first they got to know you exist, then you acquire them and then you retain them. All very, very simple. Our offering is the basically the product or service, the appeal of our brand, Adam Ferrier, and customer experience, Matt Watkinson, right? Rivalry depends on the category we're in, the territory we cover and who else is in there. So this is all very simple. But what we need to do when we're making decisions or when we're stress testing our, our business or if we've got a startup idea or whatever, is be looking at all of these factors, not just, not just one or two of them. Now, when it comes to customer experience, what most people are saying is, if we spend money on this, we're going to get this. And if we get this, you know, we're hoping that we're going to get this. That's the dominant logic. And that logic might, might work in some circumstances. But what people aren't doing is saying, tell me which of these things are good or bad about your business, and I'll tell you how I can use this to help. That is the difference, right? So, oh, you have adoption barriers that are stopping people from buying your product. That's up here. We might be able to lower those by improving the path to purchase. Oh, you're entering a new territory. How might we localize that experience to make it better for people who speak a different language? Oh, it looks like you're struggling to acquire customers or that your conversion rate here is low. How might we Im improve that? Oh, it looks like you're spending a ton of money on these expensive interactions and complaints. Whereas if we fix those, we'll save you a, a ton of money or maybe we can drive people to a self-service channel that's, that's cheaper, right? whatever it might be. Oh, it looks like, you know, you've got too much complexity or, or you can't scale. Maybe we need to look at what that experience is like to make it scalable. Oh, it looks like there's some unmet needs that if we met them, it might make people like you more. Oh, it looks like we're clashing with a customer's fundamental belief, whatever it might be. What I'm trying to say is that there's this universe of ways that customer experience or behavioral economics or whatever it is that we're talking about can actually help a business succeed in a really powerful, really structured, really efficient, lethally effective way if we start from the basis of discussing all this stuff. Yet most people are still in the point of going, well, this equals this, and the rest of the grid does not exist to me. And that, that to me, is, is where I'm... Uh, this is like solid gold for anybody who's in one of those disciplines and they're trying to sell their stuff into a client or into a business and they're serious about adding value on the business and customer side. So 
I know you didn't ask me to, 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 to kind of go through it, but you know, we we're talking about this model. It's very abstract. I just wanted to show people so that they can see like, oh, now I see what, what, what he's talking about. Yeah, I hope everyone was taking furious notes through all of that. You as, as can you said, download Matt, it for free. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as, as you said, Matt, when you see the grid first off, it is kind of a bit, whoa, that's <laughs> a, a bit overwhelming. But the, the concept really is very simple, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And you can like you can download this stuff for for free on our website. I mean, we've got you know we've got all manner of these like free worksheets where you can l literally makes it brainless to go go through and 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 work through all these factors we've got them for an existing business we've got them for a startup we got them for a, a a kind of project review it's all free it's uh our website's methodical.io you can just go on there and it's there Fabulous. No thanks, brain required. Thanks so much. Everyone will be rushing, rushing over there straight, straight from saying thanks. So we are going to be rushing, rushing over there straight after, straight after this call. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean that kind of feeds into, as you say, what I was saying before. From a couple of those grids, we were talking about the idea that maybe that that the customer doesn't know what they want. Uh, and also uh, what came to mind seeing your grid was the um, grid for adaptability. Obviously, in the last 18 months, adaptability has just been key to survival. Who do you think are maybe the businesses that have adapted very well to what's been going on? Yeah, so I mean, this is the this is the like interesting thing about when you have the the grid kind of stuck in your mind, like I do, which is like for some businesses, they're like, oh shit, like my category has got unprecedented demand now, so I'm actually doing really well. For other businesses, they're like, oh my god, I can't get components to build my stuff, so I can't scale. Other businesses are like. In this territory, I've got a problem because we've got this set of regulations. And in this territory, I've got a different problem because I've got a different, different thing. Now, some people are like, well, I've, this channel has been now been completely closed down. So what do I do? What the, the lesson like of COVID really for the, like from a grid perspective was that everybody's asking, what should I do? What do we do? They're looking for guidance. Well, what you need to do is got to be based on your particular situation because it's not the same as everybody else's. And that was like the, the good thing about having a model like that is that you can look at your context rather than listening to some, you know, guru or pedagogue somewhere who thinks they know the, the answer when they're not tuned into those specific factors. I mean, a major one, obviously, is, is barriers to purchase that was in the, the top left you saw of the grid. Like that was a big thing for a lot of people because they couldn't physically go out and shop or whatever. Well, if you know that that's your problem, you just focus like a laser beam on what do I do about that? And you saw this everywhere. Like my wife's ballet class just moved to Zoom and everyone bought <laughs> ballet bars and had them in the living room. You know, and they actually did really well because suddenly they're attracting students from like South Africa or Q8 or wherever who wouldn't normally take a ballet class in Santa Monica. You know, so it, it's really about looking at it in this kind of dynamic interconnected way and considering these different factors rather than like, I need a solution without really being consciously aware of what the problem is. And, um, you know, my, my great hope for this uh, in, in endeavor in producing the book and producing the model and everything was that it would make it accessible to anybody in the way that the, the 10 principles made customer experience accessible to anyone. It would like being a strategic kind of mastermind, if you like, or adding that general business knowledge that complements every discipline would be accessible to everyone. You could just read this one book and you'd be like, okay, I'm not a lawyer, but I know enough about IP to know that it matters. Okay, I'm not a marketer, but I understand the essence of what branding is about. Okay, I'm not a, um, a pricing strategist, but I now understand 
that when people talk about contribution margins, that's something that's very important and I need to, to, to be aware of that. I know what a cost structure is, blah, 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 blah. So that was the kind of hope of, 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 of the book. And for the people who have read it, I think generally it has fulfilled that, um, that hope, setting their work in a broader context that, 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 that allows them to, to, to flourish, you know? And um, you meant, as I said, you mentioned Rory earlier on, we've chatted about Adam Ferrier. Are there mm -hmm. any other um, names in the behavioral science world that you would like to mention as being particularly influential or that you admire or any books you would recommend? Well, behavioral science, uh, is one step removed from my immediate sphere of competence. So, you know, obviously in UX design, in marketing, in, in um, product strategy, there's a lot of psychology. There's a lot of, there's a lot of testing. I think though, the back to this idea of like conscious versus unconscious incompetence, I just don't, I'm not enough immersed in the world to really have a qualified opinion on on a lot of those on a lot of those things, I'm getting my knowledge and insights from it from it, uh, you know, to a degree secondhand, and I and I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want anyone to be under any illusion that I know what I'm talking about because I, <laughs> I, I I don't, you know, that's, a, that's just well, in general about, actually. By the way, I think we can just apply it to, to everything. To UX. Matt, you know, who else, obviously, besides your own, uh, for people either uh, g learning about UX or who are in that field, uh, which other particular books do you think have been influential uh, in your journey? Well, um, it's difficult to answer because the, the way that I, how am I going to explain it? The way that I approach trying to accumulate knowledge about things is, is, is kind of bimodal. So on the one hand, I wanna be well-versed in, in the basics of what everybody already knows, okay? So I've read all the standard UX books like Don't Make Me Think, or most of the CX books like The Effortless Experience by Matt Dixon, which is a you know, beautiful, beautiful book, that kind of stuff. Uh, Byron Sharp stuff, How Brands Grow, which I saw popped up in like a little chat bubble. Awesome, like mandatory. Everyone has to read these things. But then what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to say, well, if I'm going to outperform everybody, I can't be working from the same set of insights as them. So what I need to do is I need to find some weird shit that nobody is reading that is going to be interesting. So when I was researching the grid, I read that book. Um, I even have it here. Yeah, I have it here. Like I was reading like weird anatomy textbooks, like literally trying to understand like how does somebody who does physical therapy think about the interconnections in the in the body? You know, when I was you know, researching my other, my customer experience book, I was thinking about like actors do a really good job of impersonating other people and bringing those characters to life. So they must have some process for understanding people or getting to know people. So I was reading books on like the Stanislavski system of how they get into a role and embody that person because I thought, well, that might be a better way of doing customer research than the way they, we do it now. How do method actors do it? You know, so I was, I'm, I'm not purposefully being, being evasive in trying to make recommendations, but the books that I've read that have most influenced me have been like totally obscure books on sociology or anthropology or anatomy or philosophy from strange French people or how to be a good actor because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say what knowledge is out there that we'd, we're just not even aware of that might be really interesting to to play around with or or or, or, or try so I'm always looking at uh, 
at that. I read very few straight, straight business books because everybody's read them. I mean, I yeah. think that's great. I, 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 that's great to hear, that, really, Matt. Really because, weird answer, yeah, I mean, the so. reality is, <laughs> whenever anyone asks you to recommend a book, it's it is very challenging. And as you say, there's aspects of so many books that you've liked and that hold with you. But um, I mean, come on, look, this is a third of them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, one of this our members was saying the favorite one from behind you, Kindle, but yeah, yeah. You've, you've a fair, you've a fair old bookcase behind you. But as you say, we're made up of uh, many different parts uh, with our reading, and you can just never know when something from either a past experience or some random thing that you read actually then resonates yeah, and sure. sparks off another thought in your mind um so you just we we can't tell what are going to be the things that uh inspire us uh, or or as i say spark that random thought that leads then to something connected to yeah. our particular subject like a book, a book has an insanely high return on investment if there's one sentence in there that changes the way you see the world or changes your life. So that's how I approach reading. Like I'm, I'm just looking for one thing that shifts my world's axis a little bit, or one insight where I'm like, oh, I didn't, I didn't really see that that coming, or just something that I can noodle on or, or riff on a little bit or play around with or, or or might expand my mind or might give me a different different perspective on it because have, have, having realized you know that actually the key is to just be open-minded and and receptive to new ideas and that there's no such thing as like a stupid question you know having having realized that that's really the aim of the game i think it's and maybe arriving at that realization a little bit later in life than I would I would like to, because you, know, you go to school and everyone's like, do as you're told. Read this and then regurgitate it onto the page and we'll give you a good score. Stand in line, blah, 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 blah. Then you go into the workforce, everyone's like, right, now we need you to take risks and innovate and rip up the rule book and do things differently. You're like, well, hang on a second. I spent the last fucking 22 years of my life being told that I can't do that. And, and you've given me no skills whatsoever to help me doing this. And now you're just telling me to do it. Like, that's a whole other conversation. But the point is that having realized that, like, the hegemony of your mindset and your ability to be plastic in your mind and, 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 and get diverse in your diet, like, in who you spend time with, in who you talk to, in where you look for ideas in sources of inspiration, even in the skills that you try and learn. You know, I, pro I learned a lot about business from learning to surf because I was thinking of the waves as like a, an analogy for change. You know, like, well, what do surfers do? They always look at the horizon and they paddle towards the waves rather than away from them because otherwise you get smashed. Like, why don't we do that? So, yeah, just being an omnivore in, in, in every aspect of life, I think just gives you a million more dots that you can connect to new ideas and new ideas are the lifeblood of everything that we're trying to do you know so right very inspirational Matt I think we've gone quite philosophical at, at this stage <laughs> well, I can't, and, I can't uh, stay on track like, I'm afraid like yourself I'm I'm personally no admirer of uh the traditional education system and did me any favors that's for sure um I and uh, yeah disaster. universities there uh don't exactly encourage the questioning mind um but it's been an absolute joy to have you join us matt i think everyone's been very inspired by everything that you've been saying i can see lots of smiles coming from everybody all around um change i'm not in a hurry by the way if you still want to if people have got questions. Well, that, that's, that's very kind, Matt. Thanks very much. So if anybody uh, particularly wants to put a question to Matt, please uh, pop your name down there in the chat box. There's been lots of comments going along. I don't think they're necessarily questions, um, but any of you can 
join me if you want to put a question to Matt or you can unmute yourself and just charge on in there. Um, uh, if any of you have questions there, Shrutin's here with us. He often joins us and Kathleen, you're very welcome. Tony, Alessandro, thanks very much for joining us here today. Um, if you've got any questions for Matt. And I'm um, just going to scroll back here now and we'll look at some of the comments there, Matt. And uh, Aishwara was saying she doesn't think that, uh, doesn't, he doesn't think that business processes independence could be explained in such detail. Really enjoyed the description there. Everyone's liking your checklists and make sure everybody has your website there. That's uh, methodical.io. Yeah, and anyone obviously can just connect with me on on LinkedIn if they've got anything else that they want to ask me later. If they're lying awake at night with some burning question <laughs> in their mind about <laughs> about <laughs> cost structuring, fixed versus variable costs, and capital yeah, expenditure. All those exciting yeah, subjects. Uh, all those kind of thrilling things. Does, that I've does have to a question? On. Would you like to join us, uh, manage and put that to Matt yourself? Um, sure. Um, hi, Matt. Uh, really interesting to hear you and uh, your perspective on various things. Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, when I try to read a book, it, at times it becomes very difficult to distill the essence of the book because like, uh, sometimes you have four ideas and uh, like the example that you gave 70,000 words. How do you go about reading? I mean, I see a lot of books behind you. How do you actually go about reading the book and kind of maybe distilling out the right information or uh, what's the process that you use uh, from, from your perspective, if you can share something? Yeah, I can. I can uh, explain exactly how I do that, because what I have is, um, let me just see here. What I've actually had to do, because the uh, amount of, um, of reading has just got kind of totally ridiculous, is that I have a... Um, I have a database of notes um, that is culled from every single book that I've that I've I've read. So let's have a look here. God, I don't think I've ever I think I've ever shared this organized, before. organized, Matt. <laughs> I don't think I've ever shared this before. Can you see this here? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. uh, okay, so this is my structure for. Um, uh oh is are we looking at the which one are we looking at hang on i'm not sure which one i'm sharing is it the is it causes of unpredictability we can see at the top is the file is the folder rnrdb oh this one here okay so here we go <laughs> so what you've got down here is these are just this is a, a small subsection of them so you've probably heard of some of these books like um Goals gone, goals gone wild, or fooled by randomness, or so. Let, if we go into a book like uh, Rory Sutherland's book, "Hey Alchemy," so I read the whole book and I take notes, and then I atomize the whole book, and then I put it back together by theme. So this is these are all kind of the different things that Rory is is mentioning, and they're broken out into these individual note cards. And I read every single book I read is broken apart like that every single book right and we're talking about like hundreds by now so then when i go to write my own book once i've got the structure in place and i'm writing a chapter on say causes of unpredictability which i'm right here i then fold all of those things into this new structure from across the portfolio of books that i've read uh so you know these are all the forms of uncertainty that i've identified in my research or whatever you know, this is information, this is self-deception from Robert Trivers, which I'm sure a lot of you have read, blah, 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 blah. And then as I end up incorporating those in the manuscript, I, I then kind of cross them off. So oh. most people, when they see that, their brain just melts. So like, how, how, how do you do that? But, but it just is very diligent, very time consuming work to go through every single book and dissect it and take the insights out and then just systematically repackage them by the themes that you're interested in writing about. 
and then use that as the basis for structuring and writing your book. And that's how, in my opinion, you end up with a book that has a lot of value that's resting on really solid theory uh, that you can lead people lead people to. And that database for the grid, by the way, I didn't show you the grid file, I showed you the one for the new book. But the database for the grid is 320,000 words of notes that have been folded in to, to the, 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 the structure of the book over the course of five years. A, a lot of a lot of wows and <laughs> is, is that the answer you were expecting or were you like oh, you emojis. yeah going up there <laughs> in the chat box that was yeah seriously impressive and far more efficient than my random underlinings and scribbles in the margins oh. all over the books and then trying yeah. to remember where did I see that line and <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean and beyond a certain threshold you need systems <laughs> Beyond a certain threshold of, 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 of volume of information that you're dealing with, you need to kind of create a system. Otherwise, like you're saying, like you just can't cope. Like you can't cope with reading that volume of stuff and wanting to learn from it and, and take your insights from it without some kind of, 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 of system. One thing that's made it a lot easier recently is that now we have like dictaphone uh, apps, like dictation apps where it, as I'm reading the book, I can literally read out the section and it will record it as text. So I'm like, I'm like a kind of weird nerd, like page six, <laughs> chapter two, blah, 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 like reading it. And then it, and then I, I can import that file in. So it used to be really tough doing it with, um, doing it with, with, uh, you know, paper books, but you can see like, you have to have all these flags and stuff just to remind you of what you've read and what you haven't. And, yeah, I mean it's a it's a job, you know, and, and, and I I approach it. I mean it's my it's it's kind of my work, you know. So I yeah. I take it pretty trying to take two things too many things in life seriously, but you know I'm I'm a writer and I want to write the best book I can, and I want to if somebody is giving up six seven hours of their time to read what you have written, it is a matter of respect that you they get something for that in my mind like that's how i that's how i think about it you give me your time i give you the most value that i can that's how i approach my my writing and 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 everything so it's like a it's a you know i'm not kind of messing around it's not a hobby for me i, I want it to be great you know yeah, that that's that's very admirable and yeah. the respect towards the reader I think is is something that's sort of rarely seen, as you say. So many people seem to be writing for themselves. Uh, Shrutin, do you want to join us? You have a question from Matt. Is it? Are you insane? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I I've been asked that. Are you on the spectrum? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm just. Uh, I'm Go ahead, normal. Shrutin. That's uh, incredible. Uh... Matt, I just want to ask you, uh, what application was that where you kind of document? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the tool is called uh, Scrivener. Okay, um, right. Yeah, it's not expensive. It is a little bit unwieldy, but once you get your head around it, it's... Uh, yeah, there's a reason that I've got like a RAID 5 backup system on my desk, and I've got Black Bays, and I've got iCloud, like everything backed up in triplicate because it just becomes insanely valuable when once you have a product like that and you've got your head around it so yeah highly recommended uh with regard to the discussion around uh, you know do we ask customers or not uh, i just wanted to share a thought actually uh, sure. so, so i work more uh, in the field of design thinking and uh, i wrote a book around it a couple of years back uh, so around the time i think when i was when i just started working on the book uh, initially, it was just to share my experiences, but then uh, you know, as I dug deeper into the topic itself, uh, I learned a lot more about design thinking itself. So then I was able to offer, uh, you know, the most popular uh, method around is the Stanford, you know, five-step model. Uh, but I found that a lot of people weren't really understanding it, so they knew it, you know, the whole empathy and define and all of that, but uh, a lot of people didn't really get it. So when I try to understand it better from an uh, application perspective. Uh, I came across something that, you know, I thought would give some perspective to uh, do we ask customers or not. Uh, so for me, uh, the steps, it's like a nine step process where 
uh, there are three steps at the bottom which kind of stretch from beginning to end. They start with humility. That's where uh, we as, let's say, researchers put ourselves in the back seat. Uh, the second would be empathy, where we try and figure out uh, or try and understand how the journey is for somebody else. And the third is intent. So, so let's say you are heading a company, right? From that point of view, how does uh, design thinking work, at least from my perspective, is uh, first you put yourself in the backseat and you give more importance to, let's say, your employees and your customers. Uh, even without any intent where, uh, you know, you're not trying to make any kind of difference, but uh, with humility and intent, you, you're you still capturing information about them. You know? So whether or not uh, you're just aware of how things are and then as in when you know an opportunity presents or let's say this competition or whatever uh, and the intent kind of comes into place you have the you have the kind of resources the the information to then apply and then you know use web ideation and find solutions so i just want to kind of mention that that uh while a customer wouldn't really give you what the solution is like you rightly mentioned uh, I think without the help, we can't arrive at those solutions because they kind of give you those inputs uh, in some crude fashion or you know in some uh, abstract manner, uh, which I think then inspires a solution. But then that solution, uh, in my opinion, does not come without their inputs. I uh, just want to share that. Yeah, yeah. I I mean I I, I don't disagree with that uh, uh, at all. You know, I, I don't disagree with that. Everything that we're trying to do, everything that we're trying to design, every decision that we're, we're making is effectively a hypothesis until it's proven or disproven by, by, by the market and, and, and by the customer, in, 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 in fact. I, I guess where the distinction comes in is, are we prepared to try something and then see how the customer responds to it? Or are we going to research what we think our customer wants and then try and give that to them? And both have their role to play. I, I'm not. I'm, I would. I would not debate that. And and ultimately, you know, if the customer doesn't buy the product, that's our. That's a problem for us. Or well, they don't like it, or it doesn't create value for them. I guess the question is, how much emphasis should any organisation put on this kind of exploitative growth, which is doing what we're doing better? versus this exploratory growth, which is, are we just going to try stuff out and see, see what we think is, is, is going to work, you know? And, and in fact, there's a pretty good quote from Bezos on this saying like, if you'd ask people, do you want something like the size of a Pringles can that talks to you from the corner of your kitchen? They would say, absolutely not. Like, this is a, what you're talking about. But the Echo is a really successful product. Sometimes you need to build it and try it or prototype it and then see. And that is what your research process looks like. That's still research. Whereas I think some people are in this mindset of, no, 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 we do all the research first and then we arrive at a, at a solution. And that, that works too. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have a, 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 a favorite, but I think that there's... There's some discussion to be had around like, are we really thinking about both of those opportunities or are we skewing to one, which just leads us to this kind of incrementalism. Whereas if we were had a bit more of a risk appetite or we base it on, on a kind of theory, but we're willing to like lead the customer, maybe that would be advantageous for us. But yeah, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. Thanks. And, and in fact, you know, you, you articulated it very nicely as well. I can tell that you put a lot of thought into, uh, into the book and, you, and, and your ideas and stuff. And if you send me a message, I'll, I'll check it out. Thanks. Thanks so much, Shrutin, for joining Thanks. us and for, and for sharing that. So um, everybody knows I'm a stickler for time. And uh, so we are going to wrap up Everyone except this me. event. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to wrap up this event. So uh, yeah. we would like to thank you so much, Matt, for joining us today. It's been a really insightful conversation. I think we've covered a fair amount of ground. And um, thank you so much for joining us, everybody hop over to 
Matt's site there now. Would you like to just read out the web address for one final time, Matt, Matt to make sure everyone got it? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm on I'm on LinkedIn and I look like this. <laughs> so you can find me pretty easily. And the website uh, for the for the um, worksheets and, and stuff. And there's actually a digital version of the tool as, as, as well, an online version is methodical.io. Um, yeah, and I hope you'll keep in touch. Thanks everybody. And thank you Thanks for changing much. the time for me. I can't, I, <laughs> Seth says I have a tiny kid and I can't do Saturday morning, that'd be a disaster. <laughs> thank you for so, joining um, us. Thank you for yeah. joining us on your Friday. Thank you everyone for joining us on your Friday. All of our members who join us weekly and new members, of course, all very welcome. And we look forward to seeing you same time next week on Saturday. Uh, and see you next week, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us. Goodbye now. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah.